Welcome to the bucket list on Lake Champlain. Guys, this is uh, something I've been looking forward to bringing to you guys for a long time. It's been on our, our production schedule and we're finally here. And it's, this is, this is a special lake to me. This is Lake Champlain. This has been a place that, man, I, I, I fell in love with from the first moment that I came here. It's been so long ago now that uh, that was my first experience fishing here on Lake Champlain. And I remember when I, when I first came, the I was so amazed at the abundance of life on this lake. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. I saw something that, that lit a fire in me that I had never seen before. Uh, just, uh, just so many fish, so many bait fish, so many birds set here in the Adirondack Mountains. Small mouth, giant large mouth, northern pike everywhere. Uh, every type of fish species that you want to go after is here, but none more abundant than the large mouth and small mouth bass that live here. And the size, uh, a lot of the lakes that we have been to throughout the country, you know, you know, catching four pound fish is kind of tricky. Not here, you know, four pounders abound in both species and there are just absolute blast of fish. I'm gonna be joined shortly by my partner, Mike Iconelli. Him and I both have had a love affair with this lake, had a lot of success tournament fishing this lake, had, had just a lot of fun learning how to fish these types of waters on this lake. Whether you're fishing for largemouth or smallmouth bass, we're gonna give you the tools, show you how we do that, and we're gonna be doing it here on Lake Champlain. Man! Oh, God! <laughs> oh, my God! Good night! <laughs> Welcome to Lake Champlain Bucket List, Bass University. Whoo! This is my favorite lake, it always has been, and this is why. This fish is 20 years old, and there's so many of them. They're so beautiful and thick. We're here in September. They're feeding up, getting ready for their winter, and that's just a beautiful, beautiful largemouth bass. Beautiful Lake Champlain bass. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Mike Iconelli's gonna be here. We're gonna be talking to him about all his great Lake Champlain stories, and we're gonna be fishing for these guys and some brown ones too. So, so stay with us guys. Pete Gluzek for the Bash University Bucket List. Why should Lake Champlain be on everybody's bucket list? Cause it's gotta be, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, why is it? And you know what's funny though, before I answer that, when you ask people, and you, you know, that's a question that we get all the time. We've been getting that question for 10 years. What's your favorite place yeah. to go? Dude, 75, 80% of the guys, I don't care if you're from Florida or Texas or Alabama or up where we're from, Champlain's always on their list, dude. If it's not number one, it's two or three. Right. right? Why is that? You know, I, I think, I think because it's a dynamic lake from the standpoint of catching 50% largemouth and 50% smallmouth in, in a given area. I think that's the unique factor. There's a lot of smaller ones, but the big one is, dude, where else can you go and catch 20 pounds of largemouth, flip in the reeds, turn around, go back on the same stretch, but fish out and catch 20 pounds of smallmouth? Where else can you go in the country and do that? That's, that's the reason, a big reason, I think. And then all the other stuff, man, the, the sheer size of it, you know, the, the, uh, the, the beauty of this area, we're upstate New York, you know, right now in the fall, I mean, the leaves are changing, it's gorgeous, you know. Not a lot of lakes 
in the country where I think this is a lake that you can still go and catch a fish that's never seen a bait in certain areas of the lake. The middle of the lake, dude, I really believe my heart and soul there are fish in the middle of the lake that have never seen, a, that have never bit an artificial lure. Very rare, dude, very rare. That's this lake, you know, special. Yeah, it's, dude, it's 150 miles long and, and you're right. Yeah. There's fish that haven't seen stuff. Yeah. They call it the, what, what do they call it, the, the last Great Lake or the? The sixth the Great sixth Lake. Sixth Great Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the sixth largest lake in the yeah. United States. It was founded, or it was discovered in the 1600s. By, by Champlain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't know how I guessed that. <laughs> yep, and, and um, you know, a few years after that was the first time I fished here. <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> that was right before Woodstock, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a little bit before Woodstock. Okay. That was the first time I fished here. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you fished? Dude, I remember, I remember the first time I fished Lake Champlain like it was yesterday. And it was so long ago. It was uh, May, late May of 1990. It, I had just first joined my bass club. I was a senior in high school. And the club that I joined, named Top Rod Bassmasters, they had a club trip every year. And this is where they would go. So Top Rod and the competing club, which was Barrington Rod and Reel, had been gone even before that, probably since the mid 80s. So I had built up that, well, man, when I joined this club, this is one of the reasons I want to join this club is, dude, I keep hearing these stories of Hudger Fish Days. I'm like, Pops, this can't be true, you know what I mean? But I remember coming up here with my club, staying at a cabin just like this. It was a different cabin, it was a cabin in the passage, what we call the passage. And um, dude, I remember how basic everything was back then, you know? I had four rods, I had a tackle bag, tackle logic, tackle bag. We had to bring a trolling motor up because you got in a rental boat. When you rented the cabin, you also got a 14 foot, 14 or 16 foot V-hull with the cabin. And it had like a, 15 or 20 on it gas, so you, but you would bring your own trolling motor. So we brought trolling motors, we brought these portable depth finders that had a suction cup transducer. Dude, it was, it was really exciting, you know? But I remember the first, we get up here in the first morning, you know, it's like the anticipation of, is it gonna live up to the hype that I've heard about? You know, it's my first time, and it's huge. And, you know, we, literally, we, we're in the passage and we launch, and we kind of all follow each other. And it's funny that this is the first place I ever fished on Champlain and it's still an amazing spot. And we make a right out of the cabins and we start going and we're just looking around. It's, we've never been here before. Who knows where to fish? You're looking around. And all of a sudden, as we get a little bit further down, we start seeing these giant white rocks. And it's so eye-catching, you know? It drew our eye and we went to these white rocks. And I mean, three boats staggered in a row on these white rocks and I, we, we caught a hundred apiece. It was the most unbelievable, you know, experience up to that point in my life for catching numbers of fish, size of fish, and the mix that was there, you know. You know, 50 small mouse and 50 large mouse in one day on pretty much anything you wanted to throw, you know, spinner baits, soft baits, vibrate, lipless vibrations back then. It was incredible. And I mean, it was the kind of experience that, you know, hooks you on this place, you know? Now, it was a long time ago, you know? It was a long, long time ago. 30 and years ago. 30 years ago. And um, I don't know that it's quite as good. A lot's happened in those 30 years. This lake's received a lot of pressure. But there is still the potential to come out here and catch 100 fish in a day. That's, dude, that's special. That's special, dude. That is, that is pretty awesome yeah. about this place. Yeah. And I think you might have done that today. Yeah. We I let you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, damn camera guys, you know? They would let me just fish in the rain. We'd be all right. We got to sit in the cabin and talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, uh, your buddy John McGraw, my buddy, yeah. too, said that you ruined the Lake Champlain trips. I did. You absolutely ruined it because it was all even all even field, you come up, you get the John boats, but then the one year you showed up with a brand new Ranger. I did. 
and ruin everything. I probably did ruin it. I probably did ruin it. Yeah, I zip it around. Dude, it was incredible because it was literally, you know, again, you got to remember um, this trip was always for Top Rod. It was always late May, early June. And I won that tournament. It was the 1994 Bassmaster Top 150 on Lake Norman. I fished as a co angler, and first place was a bass boat, it was a 374V. So I came up here pulling this boat, basically not knowing how to drive a bass boat, not knowing how to back it in. In fact, when I launched it at Gwen's place, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the plug in. I didn't, even know, I didn't even know you were supposed to have a plug in, but I sunk the boat as soon as I launched it. Um, but it was interesting because I learned a lot about the boat, but it opened up this place for me for the first time. You know, we were limited to a certain extent with a 14 foot John boat. And outside of the passage, and maybe gone five miles that way and five miles that way, we didn't know a whole lot. And all of a sudden now I had a 18 foot boat with a 150 and I learned what's, what's past that bridge at the mouth of Massissiquoi? What's up there? The Inland Sea was always so intimidating. What's down the Inland Sea? What's this Knights Island, Butler Island? What is that? And it really did, it, it probably did ruin it. Um, because, you know, it, it really expanded the horizons and you got to see how dynamic this lake was. It's not just white rock and, and reed banks. It's, you know, boulders, it's island points, it's docks, it's uh, cans, buoy cans, it's sailboats, it's all this stuff. And, um, man, I learned a lot. I don't know, outside of fishing in South Jersey, I don't know that there's a single lake that I've fished in my lifetime that I've learned more at than, than Lake Champlain. Honestly, I think from, from power fishing to finesse fishing to everything in between, I think I've learned more at this fishery than any other lake you know, in, my, in my life. You know? It's amazing what happens when you get 100 bites in a day. It's crazy. It's eye-opening about yeah. how fish yeah. re and, and, behave. And, and it, it, you go from not knowing a bait to getting those bites and, and it's confidence and that you get to that mastery level. Mm -hmm. You know, like the lipless bait's a good example. The first couple of years we were catching them on lipless here. I had caught fish on a rattle trap, rattle spot up to that point, but when you have 50, 100 fish days, you start to learn the bait really well. You know, what it does and, you know, slow roll versus burn versus yo yo. And it's amazing. So I could probably think of five to ten baits that I feel like I mastered here. You know, I've caught, I caught them on it, fish on it before, but catching that many fish here took me to that level of mastery where you can go anywhere with the utmost confidence and catch a fish on that bait, you know? I can vividly remember back when I was a kid and, you know, searching for information and it was so much work and it was such a struggle to get that knowledge, to get that information. We talked about the equipment, we talked about the bait, we talked about how to pick it apart. It's highly detailed, specific information from A to Z to help you learn, get to the water, and become a better angler quickly. That's what the Bash University is all about. Oh, he thumped it and <laughs> I was ready to call for the net again. Now you'll see me raise my rod tip up when I'm trying to come over the rocks and get out of the grass, but then I put my rod tip right back down so I can get that bait down, down to where it needs to be. That's a nice feature of, of this eight foot rod is I can really get that bait out there. Ooh. Oh, holy come on.
man, they just knock slack in the line. I had one on and missed it, and this one came back and got it. <laughs> Did you see that? Man, this looks like another good one. Oh, it is, it's another big fish. Another big Lake Champlain fish. God, good Lord, look at the size of this. Get down here. <laughs> look at that. Choked it. Wiggle wart. Good gosh. Lake Champlain, guys. Whew. I gotta come down here. Oh my gosh. This. I mean, fish like this are so old, they've been around forever. It's a beautiful northern largemouth. Man, did he really, he just wolfed on that wiggle wart. And this is, this is why I call this lake my, my favorite lake. There it is. There it is. Look at that. Wiggle wart. Giant largemouth. <laughs> That's just amazing. Amazing. This is, uh, uh, this, this kind of fish right here, this is what, this is what helped me fall in love with Lake Champlain. These beautiful, look at the belly. Look at the healthiness of this fish. It's just an absolute beautiful, beautiful largemouth bass. It's a northern strain. It's up here chomping yellow perch and there's just piles of these guys up here, way up by the Canadian border. It's just so much fun. Whether you're fishing for these fish or you're fishing for brown fish, I'm gonna let this guy go. Oh my gosh, what a fish. What a fish, there he goes. <laughs> Man, it just reminds me, it brings me back every time that happens to the, to the first days that, that I came here on this lake and they, they sent me here for a Bassmasters tournament, Bassmaster top 100 years ago. And uh, I'd never been here, I saw it on the, on the schedule and the first day I put on put my boat in this body of water, it just developed a love affair for the for this lake because of the opportunity to catch fish like that and lots of them. And being able to do it in so many different ways, whether you like to fish grass or rocks or docks, uh, you know, trees, creeks, main lake, those fish live here. They live here in schools. And, um, and it's just so much fun. It's just so much fun. You can catch them on uh, everything from flipping and cranking to caught that fish on a, on a, on a wiggle wart. And um, you know, be able to catch fish like that, be able to move back and forth between largemouth and smallmouth all day long. Set up here in the, in the Adirondack Mountains. This is one of the prettiest places on earth. Uh, it's just, it's my favorite, it's my favorite place to fish. You gotta come up here, you gotta take some time, bring the family, bring your fishing buddies and your club, come up here and, and enjoy this lake if it's on your bucket list. Uh, and it should be, if it's not, it needs to be on your bucket list. It's just a, it's a phenomenal place to fish. It's so unique, it's so diverse, and it's so abundant with life. Come on up here and enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's switch gears here a little bit. All right. We're gonna we're gonna drop some Bass University knowledge on people. BU knowledge. Yes, we're gonna try to do that a little bit. All right. Um, from someone that has never been to this lake before. Yeah. Take take us on a, a a talking tour from Ticonderoga all the way up to Canada. Absolutely. In my opinion, Lake Champlain it's massive. Like I said, it's the sixth Great Lake. You know, it's giant. But you can break it into three sections, in my opinion. You know, you've got the north section of the lake. If you draw a straight line from Plattsburgh to Mallets Bay to Burlington, Vermont, everything from there up, I would consider the north end of the lake. Um, it's my favorite area of the lake, you know, to, to put it frankly. And the reason is because it's really a 50-50, a true 50-50 fishery up here. It's got 
dynamic shallow flats and coves. It's got deep rock, sheer bluff, everything in between. I love the northern northern section of the lake. The other thing that's great about the northern section of the lake is you can get around up here. Um, you know, the wind blows, you can get to a ramp. Even if you launch somewhere, you can usually hide behind something. So I like that factor. Um, then you go to the mid-section lake. So that would be from, from Burlington to Plattsburgh, south, all the way to the, um, the Champlain Bridge, you know, where the entrance to Ticonderoga is. That, to me, is sort of the, the middle section of the lake. The beauty of that area is that it's the most undiscovered, under, underfished section of the lake. And, you know, I, I mentioned it before, but I really do think there are schools of fish that are swimming in that midsection that are unmolested, that don't get fished for, you know. Um, the middle section, you lose some of the largemouth water, right? It's got less flats. It's got less weedy coves. You've got more deep structure, more vertical structure, more rock. So it's, it's smallmouth water, you know. It's smallmouth heaven in, in the midsection. And then you've got the bottom of the lake, which almost is a system into its own, you know. And um, it's the dirtiest water in the lake. It's got the most color. It's uh, more ravine. You know, it has more river characteristics throughout that section. And that's from the Champlain Bridge, the mouth of Ticonderoga, you know, where, where Ticonderoga begins, all the way down to the lock, you know. Um, literally, Champlain, I remember my, my early Red Man days, I fished around the lock. There's a lock and dam down there where it gets, you know, only a couple widths of the boat. And there's literally a, a stopping point, a lock. There's another area called South Bay. And Ticonderoga South Bay area is shallow. It's weedy, stained water. You know, deep water down there is 20, 30 foot. Central and north of Champlain, you've got 80, 100, 200, 300 foot of water in, in Mid Lake. So it's shallower, it's weedier way more flats, way more vegetation, and because of that it's dominated by largemouth down there um, and a lot of big largemouth, you know. In a tournament situation, I think the, the north end and the south end are really, you know, pri always prime targets for me. And historically, if you look, look at the winds here over the years, it's either, it's usually one in one of these two sections, you know. And again, I, I really think it's because of the flats, you know, it's it's the areas of the lake that have the biggest flats, and you know, from from BU, our rule w w is the bigger the flats, the bigger the population of fish, you know. So, um, in a nutshell, that's that's Lake Champlain, you know. The northern section of the lake, from Rouse's Point with the Canadian border, is right down to about here where Plattsburgh is. That's the that's mainly a bass and pike area, uh, a lot of shallow bays. Um, then when you go from from uh, um, you know from uh, Plattsburgh south all the way down just past Westport, that's the deeper section of the lake. A lot of lake trout and salmon are down there. That's mainly the lake trout and salmon area of the lake. But there are smallmouth and very few largemouth in that area. And then when you get past Westport and you go south, it shallows up again, and that's um, it gets a muddier water down there. It's a clay bottom, so it's nothing wrong with the water. It's just a clay bottom, so it's you can't see in that area, and that's when you start getting to more largemouth areas down there. A lot of weed beds, lead, weed areas, and stuff like that. Yep. And if you're up here, you know you wanna you wanna fish the structure. In the springtime, of course, you don't want to fish the pilings. The pilings you don't want to fish in the springtime because they're not there. They're in spawning, so they're into the shallower bays, both the largemouth and smallmouth. There's not you wouldn't catch a fish there. I notice a lot of people who don't know they just see you know, the bridges and the pilings and, you know, and that's a, a bass trail, which it is, but it's not that time of the year. So they'll, they'll waste their time fishing the pilings, really, when you should be going near the shorelines, the rocky points and, and the, actually rock and sand. Sand is a, is a, is a key thing in the springtime. Where the rock and sand meet, they, they seem to go there. And I think it's because of the heat, you know, the uh, effect of the sun in the sandier thing. I think it warms up more, and that's where they're going to the warmer water. Let's give the fans a bash you. Let's give them a secret. Give them something that you maybe don't share. A tip, a, a secret technique. Let something out okay. that maybe you haven't shared anywhere. All right. I've got a few, but, but this one I, I, do, I do want to talk about. We talked about it earlier, um, but I, I, want to, I want to reiterate it, which is 
those key spots in the grass that that Champlain's known for, right? Um, the places, those irregularities, and a lot of times it's a hard bottom spot. You know, how do you find them, you know? Because we've got the best electronics in the world now, but when you're idling a grass flat that's six to eight foot deep for five miles, you could zigzag it for three days and you're not gonna find that rock. I don't care what you do with your sensitivity. Dude, there's too much grass. There's milfoil, there's hydrilla, there's coontail. And it's, it's so much of it, you can't physically see it with your, with your graph. So, you know, I, I really, I'm going to go ahead and say that 90% of the special magic places like that, those hard irregularities in the grass that I found in Lake Champlain, 90% of them I found with the bait, not with the sonar unit. That's a, that's a big thing. I think, especially now, in this day of technology, people have gotten away from finding that stuff with the lure. And, you know, um, there's nothing better, dude, than a big jig, a half to three-quarter ounce jig, or a tungsten weight, right? Tungsten weight, a uh, half ounce, a three-quarter ounce tungsten weight to feel what's down there and let the bait find it for you, you know? You know, and, and I'll get on those flats and I'll literally do, I'll do uh, zigzags. You know, I'll, I'll go down the flat, back the flat, and I'm watching my lines so that as I fan cast, I'm doing a good job of covering that entire flat. And, you know, and, I, and I'm feeling, as I pitch in that grass, I'm feeling, you know, is it soft? I'm feeling, I'm waiting for that feeling of what, what we call the crunch. You know, and you finally, you throw that big jig or that tungsten out there, you haven't felt anything for 45 minutes, and all of a sudden you feel, feel hard. You feel it digging in. Dude, and nine times out of 10, before you, you know, you get excited, you're like, oh, that's the rock. And, and as you think it, boom, you know, and now with spot lock, and, and back in the day it was marker buoy, but now with spot lock or power poles, you stop, and it's, it can be every cast. It's unbelievable. And so using the bait, you know, to, to, find, to find those magic spots here. God, I've done it in the north end of the lake. I've done it at Ticonderoga. I've won a red man doing that down in Ticonderoga. It's such a good technique to find fish that other guys won't find, you know? Most of those other guys are gonna idle it and not see anything and leave. Or if, when they fish that flat, they're only gonna fish the outside edge of the grass. And they're virgin fish. They're fish that aren't fished for. They're, they're the load. It's the mother load. It's the juice. It's the magic. And you find it with the bait. You don't find it with a sonar. I need to remember right now what happened. That fish was shallow. He was parallel to where I'm standing. Reading that screen, watching, throwing, casting, learning. Here we go. This is one of the most exciting parts right here of the fishing day. You launch the boat, you have anticipation, you're excited, you're anxious, and it's the beginning of a puzzle that's unsolved. Our goal today is we're gonna come out here, we're gonna try to solve the puzzle, and hopefully catch some big largemouth and big smallmouth on Lake Champlain. Now that's exciting. Here we go, boys. Like, uh, it looks like we're out in the middle of nowhere, but what you have here, if you look at this, is a, you have a big flat that comes off the bank heading into this pocket, and it's loaded with grass. This whole flat's got grass on it, but interspersed with the grass are, um, are rock, rock piles, isolated rock. 
And that's really what the, what the attractor is this time of the year. Uh, we're in the fall and what happens is the, uh, all this grass is, is actually dying. This grass is starting to die off. And as that grass dies, they're really attracted to the hard, hard cover. So rocks or wood or anything hard becomes a lot more important in the fall as that grass dies. You know, the key is to find those little, find those little tiny magic spots where the rock are at. You know, that's the, that's the key. And when there's this much grass, a lot of times it's hard to find those spots with your electronics. So you have to find it with the lure. So you just cover a lot of water. Very typical fall fishing. Get on the flats, chatterbait, spinnerbait, crankbait, cover a ton of water. Let the fish tell you where they're at. The bait will find them. I'm using that right there. It's a spinnerbait by Mullix. It's a half ounce. It's got small chartreuse willows on it. I can bomb that bait out there really far and I could, I could cover tons of water. It's really just keeping it high up in the, near the surface, just trying to identify where those fish are at. So I'm using the lure to catch them, but I'm using the lure to find them. Great search bait. Watching birds too, I see a bird right there. In the grand scheme of things on a lake like this, this is Lake Champlain, it's a natural lake. There's a mix of smallmouth and largemouth. When you look at this day, this is a better largemouth day, right? It's cloudy, it's windy. The uh, largemouth prefer these conditions. The smallmouth, they don't like the wind, they don't like the clouds, they don't like the rain. They, they want it sunny, still, and the reason for that is smallmouth feed more by sight. And, and so when it's like this, they have a harder time finding the bait. Um, but largemouth, you know, they feed more on vibration. Oh, there was a bite there. I missed it. There's a look at um, some of that grass we're fishing around right there. It's called milfoil grass. And it's, uh, it's real feathery. It grows in these dense patches along these flats, and that attracts the bait fish, and the bait is what attracts the bass. So that's the key to the circle of life right there. If you have that, you're going to have bait fish. Uh-oh. <laughs> there's a bass. That's the first bite I had. All right, number one. Now, you know, I put, put the spot lock on. You get your first bite. And now it's a matter of saying, is that, was that a random bite? Or is that the first piece of the puzzle? That's the question you gotta start asking now, so. You know, largemouth, nice two pound largemouth or so. But I switched to a different technique. We had fished a, a spinner bait, a vibrating jig, and then I went to a lure that gets closer to the bottom. This can be a, this can be a bluegill or a crawfish imitation. And got my first bite in about five foot of water. So, you know, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna let this fish go and we're gonna try to get another bite. You know, if we can get another bite, it might be the beginning of a pattern. So that's, that's what we got to figure out. It's a good one, number one. It's not bad. Let that thing go. Now, let's see if we can get another bite. One bite can be luck. Two or three bites, that's not luck, that's a pattern. That's the beginnings of a pattern. That was a really strong bite too, so. I turned the boat back around right here because I saw this real dark patch of grass up here. And I was just getting ready to head back. Another one. Yeah, big one too. Big, oh God, a big giant large mouth. This is what I mean. This is pattern fishing right here. This is what you want. Look at this thing. 
Hey, look at that big giant. Wow. Wow. See how fast it could happen? You see how fast it could happen? I mean, we literally went from, we, we went from being, um, not want to say desperate, but you know, we were one spot, two spot, no bites, a couple pike. And all of a sudden we changed techniques. It's a cloudy, windy day. Why fish a bottom bait? Doesn't make any sense. But the fish, the fish have to tell you what to do. You know, that's the ultimate goal is to let the fish tell you what to do. Not your buddy, not what you read in, on the internet, but the fish. Let the fish tell you what to do. And when they're eating it like that, I mean, it's down his throat. That's a good sign. That's a, about a four pound largemouth. That's a good start to the day right there. That's a good number one. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the spot lock. I'm going to take this fish off and then I'll talk about it. This, a lot of these trolling motors now have a spot lock feature. So when I caught that first bass, I immediately, I put my spot lock on immediately and it anchored me here in this spot. I was able to make another cast to that same area and catch almost back to back fish. So that, that was a good one right there. It's a good number one right there for us. Good number one. Hopefully, hopefully this is the making of a pattern. Remember, one bite could be luck, right? But two and three bites, that's a pattern. Yes. <laughs> I am just missing them. Uh, she's gonna try to throw, sometimes it's something different. Let's go back to this vibrating jig and see what happens. There's a big load of them right here. We just got to figure out how to pick them apart now. When you get that many bites in one area, there's something special going on. Okay, I'm gonna switch again. Sometimes you just need to keep switching until you find that right bait, you know? Here you go! Oh, God, no! Golly! Big bite, big bite, and I missed him. Went back to that same beaver style bait. I'm just alternating baits now. There's a big giant group of fish there and you can see they get fired up and they slow down. And a lot of times switching, cycling between baits will re-fire the school up. So obviously we have a school of fish here. So you throw a bait, throw a bait till you feel it slow. Grab another one, throw it, throw it, throw it till you feel it slow. So now we're just cycling through some different baits right there. Once again, I, I put the spot lock down. I made just a little move. I moved about five feet, caught that fish, put the spot lock down. Immediately throw right back. I'm not gonna waste any time. See, they slow down on it, you know? Fish, fish, bite, bite, and then, and here, here's the deal, okay? So they've, they've got used to that bait. The bite is slowed, we're gonna switch again. Now we're gonna to go to a little finesse. You see me picking up a different style of rod, light line, just a soft stick bait. This is a, a Berkeley Power Bait General, um, dark color general. I'm gonna throw in that same area. We'll see with a different style bait. We're gonna just keep changing. We're gonna keep rotating between these different lures. So 
Sometimes I've seen where this smaller bait, fish slower, can fire them back up and reignite them. Here's another one. That's a fish we wouldn't have caught if we didn't make that switch. A little smaller fish, but you know, the power of continually changing, you know, constant change to keep those fish biting. It's rotating between lures, you know, and then remember where you got that bite. And I try to, I try to immediately cast back to that same exact spot. A lot of times what happens is you'll get them fired up. You know, they're competitive. So there might be two, three fish there and they see that one fish get the bait. And they're mad, you know, because they wanted the bait. <laughs> they wanted it. So a lot of times you get them fired up, you know. Another one. Another fish I wouldn't have caught if I didn't keep switching. Getting them refired up, you know. Real important. Real important. That's why you have a lot of rods on the deck. I hear so many people say, What do you need that many rods for? Why you have that many rods on the deck? You know? And this is a classic example of why. Why you want this many rods on the deck. Not just to change as you hit different targets but also to change when you find a school like this a great example of it perfect there it goes switch baits again you know, we're maximizing, maximizing the school. It's real important. Um, you know, I kept saying, you just keep switching. Went from a creature bait to a jig, back to the creature bait, to a vibrating jig, and we're reigniting the school. So we have the school identified, so now it's a matter of keeping them biting. And one of the ways to keep them biting is to change the lures. Uh, basically just went from we had a perch colored one on which is what they're feeding on but we went to a real dark one and with these conditions you know what a dark bait does if you notice all these baits are real dark uh, even the jigs black black and blue black and blue is under these dark conditions you want contrast or brightness so you know black is the ultimate contrast right it's dark, it's black, it's the absence of color. And that contrast in this, in this water with these clouds is, is attracting the bites. See if we can get another one. I really slowed it down too. I almost let it sink to the bottom, you know. Go to a spinning... There's a big one. There's a big one. There's a big one. There's a big one. No, it's a good one. It's not a big one, but it's a good one. Look at that. Whew. Man, it feels so good when you figure out a pattern. You know, you, you hear the term pattern fishing, fishing the moment. What just transpired is exactly that. We went out this morning and we want to catch, we want to catch smallmouths, but the condition wasn't right. Windy, cloudy, the water was dirty. We kept an open mind, we kept moving, and we found a pile of largemouth. Man, if you can do that in your fishing every day, if you can let go of your history, forget about your history. Fish the moment. Let the fish tell you what to do. If you can do that every time you fish, you will be, you will be a better angler. And that's that's the bottom line. Man, what a spot. What a spot.
a nice one right there. Man. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. And, it, and it's amazing that, you know, how do you find a spot like this? You know, so many people think you got to have, look, look at these electronics. They're important. Don't get me wrong. They're important. And, you, you know, it's a key part of, of the system. But these fish we found, we found them with the bait. We found them by fishing. Man, that's so important. That's so important sometimes.